Well, this is part three of our series on attesting miracles. The idea of attesting miracles is that God used miracles um, that um, were operating through Jesus as a way of proving or attesting to the fact that Jesus was indeed being used by God Almighty. And uh, sometimes these attesting miracles are called signs and wonders. Turn to Mark 16 with me. Mark 16 and verse 20. Now in Mark 16, verse 20, this is um, after Jesus has ascended back into heaven. And it says that, uh, and remember, Jesus told them, I expect for you believers, I expect signs and wonders to follow after you, uh, healing the sick, casting out demons. And it says, and they went out and they proclaimed everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by signs that followed. In other words, attesting miracles were part of what the disciples did as well. And that's really the point of this teaching, is that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit to do miracles, to do signs and wonders while he ministered here on this earth. And he wants to continue that ministry of attesting miracles through us now. I keep talking about Jesus living his life through us and, um, and, and how that, that means then that Jesus will do miracles through us. How does that work? I mean, this Jesus living his life through us. Uh, how can he be living inside of me at the same time that he's at sitting at the right hand of the Father? Well, what, how does that work? Well, this brings us to another uh, aspect of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to go to John 14, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And we're going to look at verse 12. This is the last supper time that Jesus is having with his disciples before he leaves, before he's crucified. And in John 14, 12, we read, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. So we'll do greater works than Jesus did because he went to the Father. Well, how does Jesus going to the Father help us do greater works? Well, if you go down to John 16 and verse 7, <clears throat> throughout this upper room discourse, that is, as it is sometimes called, Jesus keeps talking about an, a helper, a comforter that's coming. And in John 16, 7, he says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. I mean, I, I'll bet you they were thinking, that is hard to believe. He said, Because if I don't go away, then the helper will not come to you. But if I go then I will send him to you. Who's this helper Jesus is talking about? Go back to John 15, John 15 and 26. John 15, 26, Jesus says, When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. This helper that Jesus will send is the Holy Spirit, and it's coming to testify about Jesus. Now, this word testi testify here doesn't mean to stand up and say words uh, on behalf of someone. That word testify means to give evidence of. In other words, to give proof or attesting miracles of. The Holy Spirit comes to give miraculous proof of Jesus, the Son of God. This helper, this spirit of truth, is the Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit that filled Jesus 2,000 years ago, that filled his disciples 2,000 years ago. And he is here now on this earth, available to fill us, to do miracles through us, just like the Holy Spirit did miracles through Jesus. Okay, Father Dan, <clears throat> I got it, you say. We don't do miracles, but the Holy Spirit does miracles through us. 
How does that relate to Jesus living his life through me? Well, there's an important set of scriptures about that in Romans 8. Go to Romans 8, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 11. And as we go through these, I want to kind of help you see some things that Paul is talking about here because he's explaining how the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. Starting in verse 9, Paul says, However, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, if, indeed, the Spirit of God lives in you. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, right? But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, so he's using these terms interchangeably, Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, or Spirit of Jesus. If you don't have the Spirit of Jesus, then he doesn't, you don't belong to him. If Jesus is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit, your spirit, is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And this spirit who lives in us is, as Paul said in verse 9, the spirit of the Christ, the anointed one, the spirit of Jesus. Remember how Jesus said that if you've seen him, then you've seen the Father? Well, that's the way I think it should be with us. If you've seen a Christian, then you've seen the Holy Spirit living in that Christian. That means you've seen Jesus in that Christian. So Jesus living in me, he does that through the Holy Spirit. And he wants to continue to doing to do miracles, signs, wonders through me, just like he did when he walked on this earth as a human being. So <clears throat> If I'm going to let Jesus live his life in and through me, what should I expect? I mean, what's it going to look like? If I know what to expect, it'll help me when the Lord starts moving me in that area. It'll help me move there more easily. You know, Jesus living in and through me means that I'm going to live a life like Jesus lived here on this earth. And and it's going to be easy because he'll be living it through me. I don't have to try to figure it out. He'll come up with that. I just want to be warned in advance, Lord, where are we going so I can help you get there, right? Miracles, signs, wonders, they all work through Jesus on earth. But he seemed to live in a unique way that made these miracles possible. And we started looking at some of these last week. We looked at how Jesus was sinless and how we too can be considered sinless before God. We saw last time about how Jesus um, went out of his way. He was intentional about fasting and prayer. That was part of his rhythm of life. And today we're going to look at four more aspects of the life of Jesus, and that is that he had a very intimate relationship with his heavenly daddy. Jesus was anointed for miracles. Jesus had compassion on people, and Jesus was intentional about miracles. So let's start with Jesus had an intimate relationship with his daddy. Now remember that Jesus called his father Abba. Didn't call him Av. Av is the Hebrew word that means father, and it's formal. Abba is the informal or intimate word in Hebrew that we would translate literally as daddy. These times of prayer that Jesus spent, they led him to an intimate relationship with his heavenly daddy. John chapter 5 verse 19. Therefore, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, when he says truly twice, you know he's really telling the truth, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can, can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing first. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does 
in like manner. So Jesus only did what he first saw and heard from the Father. What if your spouse said to you, I can't do anything unless I first get direction and approval from you for it. And what if you said that back to your spouse? I mean, can you imagine a more intimate relationship with someone than that? Go to John 14. John 14, 8 through 10, back to the upper room discourse. 14, 8, Philip asks the Lord, uh, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. And Jesus, you can see him shaking his head going, oh man, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me? Now, Philip's asking about the Father. And Jesus says, you haven't come to know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do. I don't speak those words on my own, own initiative, but it's the Father living in me who's doing His works. Jesus tells His disciples that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. For That's just a, an amazingly intimate relationship. And I tell you, I think it's a lot like the relationship we're supposed to have in our marriages, in our one flesh marriages. Turn to Ephesians 5, the epistle of Ephesians, chapter 5 and verses 32 through 33. Now, up above there, the verses before this, are rich in advice about how to have a good one flesh marriage relationship. And he's talking about how the husband's supposed to love the wife as Jesus loves the church, how the wife is supposed to submit herself to the husband just as she would submit herself to Jesus. And so it's been this long discussion about marriage. And then <laughs> Paul just kind of throws a wrinkle in there. And he says in verse 32, this mystery is great, this mystery about marriage. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Well, just a minute, I thought he was talking about the relationship between husbands and wives. Yes, but what he's doing is he's comparing that. He's saying this is just like the intimate relationship we are to have with Jesus and the Father. I mean, in verse 33, he says, Nevertheless, make sure you're loving your wife and your wife respect your husband, etc. But he's really talking about this one flesh, intimate relationship that we have with our spouses is what we're supposed to have with Jesus and the Father. Have you ever watched couples who've been married for a long time? I mean, a long time, 40 or 50 years. They often finish each other's sentences. When Debbie and I are watching TV together, it's not uncommon for uh, one of us to notice something and we'll say something and whatever we say at the same time, the other one is saying exactly the same thing. Matter of fact, it's actually rarer, more rare for us not to say things together like that. Uh, I mean... <laughs> You know, people that have been married a long time, they know what the other one is thinking, what the other one needs before they even say anything. And sometimes they even start looking like each other. Have you noticed that? All these similarities happen because they've truly become one flesh. I mean, maybe it took them 50 years, but they're now one flesh. They're enjoying the benefits of that intimacy. Can you say, if you have seen me, you have seen Jesus and our Heavenly Daddy? When you can say that, when you can say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, you've seen Jesus, then your heart is beating in perfect sync with the compassion of God Almighty. Then you'll have miracles that will flow through you just like they flowed through Jesus. But listen, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. Just like with Jesus, miracles and the power of God, they flow out of our intimate relationship with God. We first have to develop 
and nurture that intimate relationship with Him. And then from there, we can expect miracles and power to flow out of us into others to help others. So Jesus had an intimate relationship with His heavenly Daddy. Number two, Jesus was anointed for miracles. He didn't just show up as the Son of God and say, hey, I'm the Son of God. I'm going to start doing miracles. He couldn't do that because he was all human. Remember, he laid aside his deity, his privileges as God. Go to Luke 4 in verse 18. We're going to read verses 18 through 21. So Jesus goes to church on Sabbath. Uh, as was their custom, and in some of our churches is the custom, somebody reads a scripture before the sermon. They gave Jesus the scroll for Isaiah. And so he finds the place in Isaiah about him, and he reads this. In verse 18 it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. It's what happens. The Spirit of the Lord comes on you. That means you're being anointed. What are you being anointed for? What was Jesus anointed for? He was anointed to preach or proclaim the good news to the poor. He was sent It says, He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who were oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed up the book or the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. All the eyes in the synagogue, everybody was looking at him. And he says this, Today, This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture is about me. This is about my anointing to do what the Father wants to do here on this earth, to heal the sick, to open blind eyes, to proclaim release to the captives. Turn to Acts chapter 10. We'll see this same kind of proclamation about Jesus in another way. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Peter's in the middle of a sermon And part of what he says in Acts 10, 38 is, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus was anointed for miracles. Now, when did Jesus receive this anointing? Well, it was when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Remember, at his baptism in water, he also got baptized in the Holy Spirit. When will you receive your anointing? Well, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Have you already been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but maybe you're feeling a little bit weak? Well, then take some intimate time with the Lord. Find a place where you can enter into praise and worship, soak in the presence of God, and there... Begin to speak in tongues. Begin to speak and uh, pray in your prayer language. I believe that as we speak in tongues, then we are being refilled with the Holy Spirit. I think that's something we ought to do all every day, at least once a day. I try to do it several times a day. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. We're talking about how Jesus was anointed for miracles. Matthew 25, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. This is the parable of the ten virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take any extra oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with the oil that was in their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy. They began to fall asleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. All of the virgins got up. They trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered and said to them, No, there's not enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers. Buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, they went in with the bridegroom to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. And he answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, I don't even know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day 
or the hour. Jesus is talking about the end times. He's talking about his return to this earth. And I, this is what I think he's saying. He's saying, because in other places he warns us, he says, this time is going to be so difficult. God's going to have to cut it short for the sake of the elect, for the sake of Christians. Otherwise, no flesh would be spared on this earth. This, these hard times are coming. I believe we are entering into the end times. And during that time, we're going to need the oil of the Holy Spirit. We're going to need that anointing flowing through us to do uh, signs and wonders, if nothing else, just to keep our families alive. And I'm telling you, I think times are going to become so difficult that others are going to ask us, please pray with me and pray for me. We're going to say, we don't have enough anointing for that. We barely got enough for ourselves. This is so difficult. Make sure that now you're practicing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Make sure now you're bringing that into your life and making that just a normal part of your life. Just a few days ago, we prayed with a young man uh, who received the Holy Spirit and he began to speak in tongues. I know that Grace has prayed over the phone for a lot of people to receive the Holy Spirit. Do you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Here's what you do. Understand that the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father. We've heard Jesus say that many times. Remember, Jesus said that he had to go away so he could send this gift to us. So there's a couple of steps. Step one to receive this gift from the Lord is to say, Lord, I desire this gift. I want this gift. Please give me this gift. And then step two is just to wait for that gift. Now, the Lord might just fill you with the Holy Spirit while you're seeking and waiting Him all by yourself. I mean, you might start speaking in tongues when you're taking a shower. I don't know. Or wake up in the morning doing that. Um, but if you don't receive the Holy Spirit there while you're waiting and seeking the Lord, get somebody else to pray with you so that you can receive. I mean, it, the important thing is this. If you're not now filled with the Holy Spirit, Start now seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit and earnestly seek the Lord until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. I know some people say, oh no, you're supposed to seek the giver of the gift, not the gift. Well, of course, we need to have an intimate relationship with the giver. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love, yet desire earnestly, want it really, really bad, spiritual gifts. The first spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit. And then from there come many other spiritual gifts. But especially desire, earnestly desire, that you may prophesy. Well, prophecy is just one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that comes when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. But you're going to need to be filled with the Holy Spirit for those gifts to flow through you. So Jesus was anointed for miracles. Number three, Jesus had compassion on people. Matthew 14. Matthew 14. Verse 14, Jesus uh, had been on a boat. He'd been out praying. He, he comes back across the Sea of Gal Galilee. He gets to the shore. He sees a large crowd, and it says he felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick. What was motivating Jesus to heal the sick was his compassion for him. God created human beings for his own pleasure. God made us for himself, and he wants to be around us. But when we're suffering, when we're in bondage to sin, when we're suffering from sickness or demonic oppression, when God's humans, his children, are suffering, God's heart is broken for us. And he wants to reach out, and he wants to touch us, and he wants to heal us. It was this compassionate heart of God that was motivating Jesus. Now, when you're spending intimate time with the Lord, Seek not only his knowledge, don't just seek his face, seek his heart too. Just ask him to reveal his heart to you so that you too can feel some of the compassion that he feels for lost and broken humanity. There are so many scriptures about compassion. Um, I don't know that we have time this morning to read them all. 
uh, let me give you a, a list. And this is not all of them. It's just a, a short list. Matthew 9, 36. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. If you want to write these down, Matthew 9, 36. Matthew 15, 32. Jesus felt compassion for people because they were hungry. Matthew 20, 34. Jesus moved with compassion, healed two blind men. Mark 1, 41. Moved with compassion, Jesus healed the leper. Luke 7, 13. Jesus felt compassion for the mother of a dead young boy. If you want miracles flowing through you, and the reason that you want miracles flowing through you is so you can be noticed or so you can be respected, you're in big trouble. If you're motivated by your own self-aggrandizement, if you want people to look up to you and call you a healer or call you pastor or think you're something special from God or think you're somehow a spiritual giant, if that's your motivation, I can tell you that you're on a fool's errand. You need to let the compassion of God be your motivation. Spend time in intimate contact with the heart of God. Ask the Lord to break your heart with compassion. Ask the Lord to let you see lost and broken humanity through His eyes. When you want to see people healed because of your heart of compassion, then God is going to begin to move through you in powerful ways. I've watched this happen over and over again. I know when I look at somebody and I feel this great compassion for them, I know two things. I know, number one, God wants me to pray for them. And number two, I know that God is planning to touch them in a miraculous way. I was in a store, I don't even remember what the store was, uh, a year or two ago, and I saw a lady and this compassion of the Lord came on me. And, um, and I went over to her and I said, I just want to let you know that God really loves you. And she said, thank you. And as I said that, the Lord gave me a prophetic word for her. I said, I feel like that uh, there's something happened in your life, something sad, there's something that's really uh, brought you down, and uh, the Lord wants to let you know He loves you. She said, well, I lost my mother a week ago. And I thought, oh, man. And so I asked her if it was okay to pray for her. She said, yes, I did. And she started crying. She said, I really felt the love of God as you prayed for me. And the Lord gave her a word. Hey, your mother's just fine. She's looking forward to seeing you again here with me someday. Just an act of compassion because I allowed God to do what he did with Jesus. And that's let me feel his compassion. So the last characteristic that I think we need to be prepared for Jesus to want to do through us, and that is to be intentional for miracles. What do I mean by being intentional for miracles? It all starts before you pray for a miracle, okay? You need to make sure that you're ready. Your intention is to get ready so that when the time comes to do some work of power, God can move through you, right? So uh, offer a prayer of repentance and forgiveness to make sure you're clean. I, I think you need to do that at the very beginning of the day. And then as the day progresses, if something happens, stay clean. Uh, spend some intimate time with the Lord. I think early in the day is better, but that may not work for you. So whatever it is, spend intimate time with the Lord. Make sure you're full of the Holy Spirit. You're anointed for miracles. To me, that means I've been speaking in tongues off and on all day long. Make sure you're prayed up, that you've done whatever fasting that God has called you to do. You haven't missed on any of that. Uh, ask the Lord to bring you opportunities where you, He can move through you. You know, that's being intentional about miracles. Lord, show me somebody that I need to pray for. Prepare your heart to hear a prophetic word for somebody. Lord, what have you got? Prepare your heart to feel that compassion of God for somebody. Okay, so you've prepared yourself for miracles. You're intentional about that. Now it comes time to pray for miracles. So how will you pray? Well, you'll pray just like Jesus did. Most of the time, he prayed a prayer of command. He commanded sickness and demons to leave people. 
But when he prayed those prayers, he actually expected God to move and do something, right? Uh, How did Jesus show he was intentional about miracles? Well, go to Mark 8. Gospel of Mark chapter 8. We'll look at the story of Jesus praying for the blind man in verse 22. Start in verse 22. He was in Bethsaida. Uh, A blind man came to him asking him to touch him. Um, He took the blind man by the hand. He brought him out of the village. After spitting on his eyes, laying hands on him, he asked, do you see anything? And the man looked around. Well, I see men like trees walking around. So Jesus laid hands on his eyes again and prayed for him. And the man looked around and his vision was restored completely. Don't pray a long-winded prayer for somebody for healing, okay? Pray a short prayer and then ask them for some feedback. Uh, Are they healed? And tell them it's okay to say no. Um, are the, have the symptoms improved? Uh, get them to check, test themselves to see if maybe they can do something they couldn't do before. Uh, did they feel any kind of touch of the Holy Spirit? Did they feel warmth or electricity? Did they hear something from the Holy Spirit? Ask what's going on. And then if they're not completely healed, pray for them again. And pray for them again if you have to. You ask, well, Father Dan, how many times should I pray for them? Well, until they're healed or until the Holy Spirit tells you to quit praying for them. You know, Oral Roberts introduced a phrase for this. He said, expect a miracle. And each day I think we need to be expecting a miracle. That's being intentional about miracles. We had an opportunity, Debbie and I had an opportunity to pray for a lady um, over the phone a few days ago. A friend had told her, uh, a friend had told us about her that she has excruciating back pain, needed prayer. We called her. Uh, She said, yes, please pray for me. And um, uh, we began to pray for her. It was lower back pain. She said, I can't even go from where I am right now, the back room of the house where she spends most of her time, to the kitchen. And when I get to the kitchen, I have to sit down and rest because the pain is so excruciating. And so we began to pray for her. And we prayed for her for a a few minutes and gave her what we heard the Lord say. Um, And then we asked her, Uh, do you feel any different? And at first she said no. And we said, well, why don't you test it out? Just move around a little and see if you can tell any difference. And she said, okay, well, it's not hurting quite as bad. Let me just walk to the kitchen and see how that is. And she gets to the kitchen. Man, I haven't done that. I can't remember when I've been able to walk to the kitchen without pain. I'm going to walk back to the other room. And she did. And she was uh, not completely pain-free, but mostly pain-free. And so we prayed for her again. And this time we prayed for her. She said, wow, when y'all were praying this time, I really felt heat on my back down there. It was like somebody put a heating pad on my back. Well, we let her know, hey, that's God. He's starting the healing process and we're just going to trust him. Continue to praise and believe that he's healing you and he's going to finish what he started. You got to be intentional. It's okay to ask, did you feel anything? And it's okay for them to say no. Um, There have been times I've had to pray for folks four or five times. And for four times, they say, no, I don't feel anything. Nothing happened. And the fifth time, all of a sudden, wow, I can move my arm or I can move my leg or or whatever it was, they're healed. So be intentional. Jesus was intentional. We can too. So in conclusion, uh, I actually think that this concept that I'm teaching is really way cool. (laughs) You know, uh, what we've learned from the Bible is that if we'll let Jesus live in and through us, just like he lived 2,000 years ago here on this earth, then we can expect Jesus to do through us, through the Holy Spirit, what he did back in those days. And, you know, God did many miracles at the hands of Jesus. And as we read, he wants to do even greater works through our hands. Let's give him a chance to do that. So be encouraged. Let Jesus live in you. Let him live through you. I promise you, it'll be the absolute best life that you can possibly live. Matter of fact, in John 10, verse 10, Jesus gives us a promise. This is the second half of that verse. John 10, 10. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. God wants us to have an abundant life. The only way we can do that is let Jesus live in and through us. Amen. God bless you.